The inhaled anesthetics have uh, effects on muscles. In fact, the inhaled anesthetics affect every part of our body, but the neuromuscular effect is particularly important, particularly important because of its need for surgical procedures and for instrumentation of the airway. How do the inhaled anesthetics produce muscle relaxation? What is it that they do? Can anyone tell us? What do they do? Can you get an effect of uh, the inhaled anesthetics without ever an effect on the neuromuscular junction? Yeah, yeah. you can. So where, is, where are the inhaled anesthetics acting to produce that effect? Central nervous system. In the central nervous system. So they're acting at higher centers to produce relaxation or an absence of an input that produces contraction. And add to this the direct effect of these anesthetics on neuromuscular <coughs> transmission. We know that they do have uh, effects on neurotransmission uh, from studies such as those conducted by uh, Jim Caldwell. So we look at the percent of fade at a tetanic stimulation. We see that as we increase anesthetic dose, this is MAC of desferrin, but it could just as well be MAC of isothorin or MAC of sevoflurin. We see that there is an increasing fade and that the presence of nitrous oxide doesn't alter that. Nitrous oxide is not a muscle relaxant. Only the potent inhaled anesthetics give us muscle relaxation. No effect. The effect of the potent inhaled agents, both the combined central effect and the effect on the neuromuscular junction itself, is sufficient to produce relaxation for surgery without any use of neuromuscular blocking drugs. Let's see that. Come back with eight breaths for me, okay? I'm going to give two cc's of that now. Okay. And how much propofol did you want to have? Uh, 200, please. Okay. sleep in just a few seconds. of things can be done without a muscle relax. What we've uh, tried to accomplish here is uh, to use uh, desclorine only, no muscle relaxant, to see if we can achieve uh, enough muscle relaxation uh, where the surgeons uh, could uh, retract the, uh, and open up the peritoneum and uh, be able to have their surgical field uh, the way that they want it. So how did you induce anesthesia? What we used was uh, propofol and fentanyl only, no muscle relaxant. Uh, we intubated her. Uh, without uh, any problem, and uh, then we uh, are maintaining our uh, desflurane concentration at an end title of 9%. 9%? Yes. And is that, is that compatible with good cardiovascular dynamics? Well, as you can see, we have a pressure of 105 over 76 and a heart rate of 66, so apparently it is. What about the relaxation? The relaxation actually is superb. Uh, they have uh, said that uh, the relaxation is working fine from a surgical standpoint, so we're very happy with the way things are turning out. And that's without any? That is no muscle relaxant whatsoever. Very good. Thank you. So if you need to achieve muscle relaxation and you don't want to give a neuromuscular blocking drug, perhaps with myasthenia gravis, one way to do it is to use a potent inhaled agent. 
at a deep level of anesthesia. On the other hand, you may not want to use a deep level of anesthesia for reasons of rapidity of recovery or depression of the circulation. This sort of evidence would suggest that you would enhance the effect of neuromuscular blocking drugs, and in fact, that is the case. Neuromuscular blocking drugs have an enhanced effect relative to an intravenous approach to anesthesia, such as a propofol anesthetic. And that's shown in this slide, which indicates the minutes of uh, achievement of paralysis uh, with various neuromuscular blocking drugs with various inhaled anesthetics, desferrin, isoflurane, and sevoflurane, compared to propofol. And in several of these cases, you can see that the little symbol here indicates that there's a difference between propofol and one or more of the potent inhaled agents in terms of how long the neuromuscular blocking drugs acted. You can also show this in terms of the dose that's required to achieve a certain level of neuromuscular blockade. Now the effect of the potent agents, as you might anticipate from the previous slides that we've done, are related to anesthetic concentration. They're also related to the age of the patient. So we look at the age-adjusted MAC of sevoflurane and how it determines the infusion rate of mubicurium that's required to achieve paralysis. Uh, we see that, that the higher the MAC multiple of sevoflurane, the lower the infusion rate that's required. And that's true in adults and it's true in children, but more is required in children. Why is more required in children? They have a greater volume of distribution. Okay, they've got a greater volume of distribution. And that would be an appropriate answer if we we're talking about a bolus of mevacurin. Indeed, the volume of distribution that would have to be occupied would have to be greater. Well, we're talking about steady state here because we're talking about an infusion of mevacurium. So there must be another answer in addition. And we had two people wanted to answer. Tracy? They have a uh, higher plasma cholinesterase levels. And that's important to mevacurium, isn't it? So they just dispose of the mevacurium faster than do adults who have a lower concentration of cholinesterase, pseudocholinesterase in the blood. And we've also discussed the need to maintain one twitch. And uh, the need to maintain one twitch is because in the absence of maintaining one twitch, if you go beyond that, you may not be able to produce recovery from paralysis. And that's very important, very important to us. It's important, if we can, to maintain even more than one twitch. Why is that? Why might you want to maintain two twitches or three twitches? Decrease the new stigmine that you need to give at yeah. the end. Yeah, and therefore, perhaps <coughs> decrease the incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting. How might the enhancement of the effect of muscle relaxants increase safety from anesthesia or from the use of the neuromuscular blocking drugs? How might we need to? Well, as you turn down the agent at the end of the case, you should get a heightened response. You should get a heightened response. So that's been shown. Been shown by Peter Wright in a study comparing uh, desferrin and isoflurane. But the more important thing is not the difference between these two agents, but the similarity in the effect of turning down the anesthetic concentration. This is a study in which anesthesia was developed and held at one and a quarter mac, one and a quarter mac, and an infusion of vecuronium was begun and continued to sustain a paralysis that was, I think, believe about 90% paralysis. So we've got, in fact, uh, 10 or 20% twitch of the controlled twitch down here. So the vecuronium is coming in, sustaining a constant level of vecuronium. We've got the isoflurane and the desferrin at one and a quarter mac, and now we turn down the desferrin and the isoflurane. We go down to 0.75 mac. Continue the vecuronium, and the blood levels were measured, so there wasn't any change in the blood levels of vecuronium. And we get reversal of the depression of the twitch. Go to an even lower level, a quarter of a mac with nitrous, a quarter of a mac, and you get a further reversal of the effect of the muscle relaxant. Again, the muscle relaxant level hasn't changed. What's changed is the anesthetic level. So we have increased the safety by reversing some of the effect of the muscle relaxant. And that's what happens when you eliminate the anesthetic on recovery from anesthesia. So it enhances the safety 
the, the delivery of anesthesia. And we can show that in one of the OR scenes. Michael, we're infusing vacuum in at uh, what rate? It's a 0.3 mics per kilo per minute, which is about 1.5 milligrams an hour. That's an awfully low dose. How can we give that low a dose and get only one twitch out of a train of four? Well, our desflurane concentration still remains high. How high is it? It's at, uh, end title is at the 7.3. And that's what, uh, MAC? That's moment? about 1.2 MAC. So the desflurane is doing what to the vecuronium? It's, it's enhancing the action of vecuronium. Normally you'd expect to give, what, how much more vecuronium than that? Probably two to, one to two mics per kilo per uh, minute uh, in, the, in the infusion rate. So that's three to six times as much that is you've achieved a great economy by giving the vecuronium the presence of a substantial concentration of desferin. Yes. We also see that there is fade in the neuromuscular response to 50 hertz tannic stimulation. What's going to happen when we turn down the desferin? I believe what should happen when we turn the desferin down, uh, we should lose that enhancement uh, that we're gaining from using it, uh, and we're going to probably gain a number of, tw uh, at least a twitch back. Um, and um, probably height of twitch too. And perhaps some of the fade on titanic stimulation will disappear. Sure. Does that add to the safety of this anesthesia we're delivering? I believe it does probably more when we go to discontinue the anesthetic, uh, probably more than any other time, because we want the patient to be uh, have all their muscular function back and uh, ready to control their own airway. Right, so we can eliminate some of the relaxing effect just by eliminating the inhaled anesthetic. So, why don't you turn the dust ring down now? Okay. We've eliminated the dust ring for 15 minutes now. What's, what's happened? What's changed? We have an increase in uh, our train of four, and uh, from that one twitch that we had before we had, when we had the dust ring at the higher concentrations, um, we've decreased it to an end title of about 1.8, 1.9, and now we have uh, uh, four twitches in the train of four. And our tetany has also increased we still have phase, but we have an increase in uh, in our tetany response. That's been pretty obvious, isn't it? Very obvious. And that's despite the fact that we have continued the vecuronium infusion. At the same rate. So the vecuronium blood level probably hasn't changed at all. Correct. Elimination of death strain then allows recovery to occur, doesn't it? It does. It's been 30 minutes since we turned off the death strain, and we've noticed what in terms of the progression of the return of neuromuscular function. We continue to get an increase in neuromuscular function as evidenced by the increase in the train of four, increase in the sustained tetany. We saw a little bit of fade at the end, but our, our sustained tetany was much more than when we looked at it 15 minutes ago. And what about the train of four? What, did, what changes did you notice there? We did have a four train of four, but we saw increased uh, twitch height on all four twitches. So not only do we have all four, but they're bigger. Correct. And that's despite what? That's despite keeping the uh, vecuronium infusion at a continuous level. So the level of desferin really makes a big difference in the response to vecuronium Absolutely. and probably to all non-depolarizing muscle relaxers. Do you think this is unique to desferin? No. Probably occurs with all potent inhaled anesthetics, doesn't it? Correct. Which is a nice safety feature of potent inhaled anesthetics. Mm -hmm. So this has implications for surgical demand for more relaxation. What can we do? The surgeon says, I want more relaxation. How are you going to deal with that? You can give more relaxant or you can increase your concentration of your potent inhaled agent. It is a, a safety factor, as we've already discussed. Uh, it decreases the need for reversal, and it decreases the potential for postoperative nausea and vomit. It has implications for the patient who has renal or hepatic failure. We don't need as much relaxant because uh, we can achieve relaxation with the use of potent inhaled agents, either alone or with small doses of neuromuscular blocking drugs. There's a special disease that uh, may also be influenced by this capacity of potent inhaled agents to produce neuromuscular blockade by itself and that, of course, is myasthenia gravis. Uh, if you were to anesthetize a patient with myasthenia gravis, how might you do it? What would you do? What would you do? 
Well, I would uh, probably induce it as usual, and then I would use a uh, use a neuromuscular blocker, but I'd titrate it to effect for so for in, uh, for induction. I'm sorry, for intubation dose, I'd use a lower than normal dose, and then uh, and then tit for my uh, sustaining relaxation during the case, I'd titrate it to effect. So you 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 would be very careful in the amount of neuromuscular blocking. Yes, right? I'd expect to use lower to myasthenic myasthenia gravis patient. Okay. Would anyone do it differently? Everybody likes that approach. You like that approach? Okay. You like that approach too? That is a very plausible way of doing it. You could also just use a, a potent inhalation agent, such as isofluorine or desfluorine or acetylfluorine, and just use it at a higher MAC level. Okay. I think that's right. And many people would say, just use the inhaled anesthetic. Just use sevoflurane. You can induce the anesthesia with sevoflurane. You don't have to give anything else. You don't have to give any neuromuscular blocking press. And you can achieve all the relaxation you need. In fact, the patient with myasthenia gravis needs very little more than sevoflurane or desfluorane or isoflurane. Why would it be important or useful to use the potent inhaled agents that are less soluble in that patient? Well, you're going to get impairment of neuromuscular function with the inhaled agent. And at the end of anesthesia, you want to get rid of that. You want to get back to normal, or as near normal function as you possibly can, as quickly as you can. Malignant hyperthermia, another problem with the neuromuscular junction. What, uh, what's malignant hyperthermia? What, what is it? Tracy, what is it? It's a hereditary disorder characterized by a hypermetabolic state. Basically, there's a defect in the ryanidine receptor, and there's an increase in calcium. Well, so. that's, that's very good. That's <laughs> more than I expected. That's terrific. Yes. All right, and so what? How does that apply to anesthesia? Well, you're not going to use uh, inhalational agents that might uh, precipitate or trigger um, the malignant hyperthermia. And almost all inhalational agents do, except for nitrous oxide. All? And, and are they all equally effective in triggering? Um, I'm not sure about that. I think there's some that are more effective, but the fact is you're not going to use inhalational agents if somebody ha has malignant hyperthermia. So. Which do you worry about most? Which one do you worry about most? Halothane. Halothane is the one you worry about most. And here's some of the evidence for that. This is uh, from the uh, MH registry. If the median minutes to the onset of malignant hyperthermia in all of the cases that they have, and it is definitely shorter with halothane than it is with either isoflurane or desfluorane. And there's no significant difference between these two. Uh, one of the reasons for that, or perhaps one of the reasons for that, is that the number of cases with desfluorane is very limited. There are far more with isoflurane, obviously because isoflurane has a far longer history of use than does desfluorane. Now, if you're going to have a problem, if you're going to have a patient who is suspected to be predisposed to malignant hyperthermia, you're going to have to deal with that and let us illustrate how uh, you might deal with it. Well, Mike, I see that you have your dantrium out and the syringe sucks the choline. You must be preparing for a malignant hyperthermia susceptible patient. Well, I think we probably can go ahead and get rid of the succinyl choline. <laughs> well, I hope you weren't going to use those together. No, not at all. All right, great. Uh, I think you have some plans to prepare your gas machine for this patient. Yes, as you can see, we have a high flow of oxygen going through, and the purpose of that is to flush out the system. We're going to do a couple other things in addition to that. We are going to remove our vaporizers. And as you can see, that's easy to accomplish on this particular machine. Now we're going to remove our uh, soda line and replace that with fresh soda line. Here I am removing the bellows. I'm now removing the anesthesia circuit and the ventilation bag. Replacing the anesthetic circuit. That is correct. 
and replacing the bellows. I'm actuating manual ventilation. And initiating mechanical ventilation. Mike, uh, was it necessary for you to remove the vaporizers? No, it wasn't necessary to remove the vaporizers. We decided to do this as an extra precautionary measure uh, because it's so simple to do on this machine. You've also done a leak check. What was the reason for that? Uh, we just wanted to make sure that uh, there was no leaks in our system. And this uh, actuating mechanical ventilation with the fresh gas flow at 12 liters a minute, that seemed to be the last thing that you were doing. And the purpose of that? The purpose of that is to make sure that we get a good uh, gas flow through the canister. The neuromuscular effects of inhaled anesthetics are considerable and they are of enormous clinical importance. Uh, for some perhaps esoteric things like myasthenic gravis, myasthenia gravis and malignant hypothermia, but they're much more important to the everyday administration of anesthesia. And the fact that the potent inhaled anesthetics enhance the effect of muscle relaxants and can cause relaxation by themselves is of enormous clinical help to us.